Without giving away too much personal information, I'm in my early 40s. I grew up in the 80s, but came to maturity in the 90s. Oftentimes, the music that someone loves as a teenager crystallizes those tastes forever. In the 90s, I loved alternative rock. Radiohead, Beck, Fiona Apple, R.E.M., Weezer. The line between what was a rock band and an alternative rock band began to blur, partly because of the hard rock riffs of Soundgarden and similar bands. My local station, WHFS, was the home of alt-rock, and I had my dial firmly tuned to it in my first car on the way to school every day. Sometimes they would play older hits from the Violent Femmes and some other bands from the 80s. I also listened to more conventional rock and popular rock on the station 98 Rock for bands like Metallica, White Zombie, and so forth. I listened to hip-hop as well. It was hard not to get caught up in the scene at the time when both Tupac and the Notorious B.I.G. were both still alive. I listen to all kinds of music now, from Billboard hits to the more obscure, from Taylor Swift to Death's Dynamic Shroud, from Gorillaz to Fleet Foxes. Rock radio still exists, but not so much that anyone notices anymore. If I want to listen to new rock bands, turning the dial to college radio seems to do the trick, but college radio does not feed hits onto the billboard charts, probably because it's college radio. The charts are not populated by rock music anymore. No alternative rock, no weird songs in the post-Nirvana 90s from oddball bands like Butthole Surfers or Cake. This change would be quite welcome if the charts had simply become more diverse, but that is not the case. It's almost entirely hip-hop, pop, and hip-hop that sounds like pop. Also, some country hits for good measure. Over the past 25 years or so, radio has gone through a process of homogenization, and with it, the entire music industry. Finding new music is easier than ever because of the internet, but the charts are unaffected by cult hits and any music outside of this homogenized format. There's no rock on the Billboard Hot 100. Okay, let's move past my personal history here or else it'll get far too. Old man yells at cloud. Like back in my day, there was only one Radiohead album and we were grateful for it. Now, the, the radio homogenization is not my story, and the fall of diverse radio actually doesn't have much to do with the anecdotal reasons that people believe. The average music fan often reaches conclusions like changing musical tastes, big stars in a different genre, and inevitable demographic shifts. Those reasons are not invalid and certainly contribute to changes in the market, but changing tastes and the elevation of particular stars over others are not inexplicable or random. It's not as simple as video killed the radio star. No, the story of radio homogenization is a tale of corporate lobbyists influencing federal law, telecommunications mergers, corporate power exerting control over popular culture, and deregulation under neoliberal capitalism. Oh, and I'll be talking about corn, but just for a minute, so get ready for that. I'll do my best to quickly summarize centuries of economic theory so we can get to the fun stuff. Global economic systems are not instituted overnight. There is no exact date when capitalism began, but by the 18th century, capitalism was in full swing. Private ownership of the means of production, wage labor, investments, the rich getting richer, exploitation both home and abroad, all that stuff. Some Enlightenment philosophers were concerned about this, as capitalism instilled greater power among the wealthy, but some philosophers disagreed. Classical liberal philosopher John Locke believed that capitalism and freedom were not contradictory ideas. He wrote, Being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Oh, life, health, liberty, and possessions. These are the characteristics of liberalism, huh? Okay, so private property is not the same as personal property. Personal property is one's own belongings that can realistically be used by one person and is not needed by the community. A record you own might be personal property. Private property is something that one person cannot realistically use by oneself and is needed by the community, like a radio station. Under capitalism, a single person can own the radio station or something else that the entire community needs in order for the community to be reliant on the capitalist. Belief in the sanctity of this private property contradicts the other defining characteristics of liberalism. Nevertheless, liberals living in the first half of the 20th century believed in a certain arrangement between capitalism and the state. The arrangement was that the state would allow the market, but the state would maintain more institutional power than the market. To accomplish this, capitalism was regulated for stated reasons of safety and the public good. 
An example related to today's topic is the Radio Act of 1927. It replaced the Radio Act of 1912 and created the Federal Radio Commission, the precursor to the Federal Communications Commission that exists today. These radio acts and radio commissions regulated, among other things, radio station ownership. Here is what the Virginia Law Review said about this in 1927, almost a century ago. Attempted monopoly or restraint of trade may, in the radio industry, take three forms. The monopolization of the manufacture of radio sets and equipment, the monopolization of telegraphic communication by combination with wire, telegraph, and cable companies through exclusive traffic agreements, etc., and monopolization of the broadcast field through a system of high-powered stations. In other words, there was concern about a few communications corporations owning too much of the market way back in the 1920s. So much concern, in fact, that new regulations were enacted through the Communications Act of 1934. Among other things, the Act forbade individuals, corporations, and governments from owning more than 20% of the capital stock of a broadcast, common carrier, or radio station. This was the law of the land for decades. Then came neoliberalism. The term neoliberalism makes you think of, you know, liberals. But neoliberal in this context refers to the classical liberal belief in private property and not the modern day social politics among those who consider themselves progressives. Neoliberal capitalism was greatly favored by conservatives in the 1970s and 80s in both the United States and the United Kingdom, because like all bad things, this is Margaret Thatcher's fault. So what is neoliberalism? In the book, A Brief History of Neoliberalism, David Harvey explained the term. Neoliberalism is, in the first instance, a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. The role of the state is to create and preserve an institutional framework appropriate to such practices. In other words, neoliberalism is an economic philosophy that redefines the previous arrangement between capitalism and the state. Liberals in the first half of the 20th century believed in an arrangement that favored capitalism regulated by the state. The state's responsibility was to be a check against the power of corporations. To neoliberals, the arrangement is deregulation, and the state's responsibility is to promote markets and to prioritize markets over other concerns. Neoliberals want you to believe that the market will fix anything, but it actually just creates problems. Neoliberal capitalism not only contradicts the other characteristics of liberalism, freedom and equality and all that, but is given priority over them because capitalism is allowed to severely hinder freedom and equality, but freedom and equality are not allowed to severely hinder capitalism. That's how capitalism is given priority under neoliberalism. The line between regulation and deregulation varies between political parties. Liberals in the Democratic Party are more likely to try to fill in the gaps of capitalism with social welfare programs, and the conservatives in the Republican Party are more likely to try to not even do that. But liberals and conservatives in the United States both promote neoliberal capitalism in one form or another. It is now standard operating procedure for global capitalism. So, what happened to the radio? 1992. In the world of music, Nirvana, Boys to Men, Red Hot Chili Peppers. In the world of politics, Bill Clinton. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the threat of communism, capitalists ran amok, and Clinton was all too happy to popularize the Democratic Party's version of neoliberalism to get elected and stay in office. As explained by Gary Gerstel, author of The Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal Order, in the 1990s, capital still wanted the U.S. government's assistance in ordering markets, but in a world cleared of communism, long its most ardent opponent, it felt the need to compromise with labor less and less. But would the Democrats, still generally perceived as the party of government regulation, deliver on the economic front? From 1994 to 1995 onward, under Clinton's stewardship, the Democrats' answer was a resounding yes. First, Clinton and his administration implemented a regime of fiscal discipline that pleased Wall Street. Second, they committed themselves under Gore's leadership to a multi-year campaign to reinvent government, making it smaller. And finally, and most important, they gave their assent to the Telecommunications Act of 1996. 
Advocates for neoliberalism always use words like pro-competition to sell people on the alleged neutrality of their ideas, but in reality these policies generally result in a lack of competition due to markets being cornered through monopolies or near monopolies. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 effectively deregulated the markets of broadcasting and communications. This had a profound effect on the radio industry and the music industry more broadly. The act allowed broadcast or mass media corporations to own hundreds of radio stations. Previously, they were confined to a limited amount of stations overall and a limited amount of stations per area. There are still some limitations, but not very many. Clear Channel, now iHeart Radio, went from about 40 stations to over 1,200 radio stations. With this level of power, a corporation could hand down dictates to all of their stations. By the time George W. Bush was in office, corporations could broadcast their own politics with greater ease. For example, Clear Channel was largely responsible for booting the Dixie Chicks off the air for the crime of being correct about the war on terror. Prior to the Telecommunications Act, if a musician did something that one radio company or one label did not like, big deal, there were so many more. Now, if you upset iHeartRadio, you may as well retire. This is exactly what capitalists wanted. That is why they spent tremendous amounts of money lobbying for the Telecommunications Act. During the 1995-1996 election cycle, mass media corporations spent $34 million on campaign contributions and lobbyists. That was approximately 40% higher than average at the time. Research indicates that this was one of the most lobbied bills in the history of the United States. This was a big push. They wanted to take over and they got what they wanted. Of course, these radio station purchases were costly. Clear Channel and others spent an enormous amount of money cornering the market. Uh-oh, debt. What to do? The new owners cut budgets, laid off employees, and increased commercials into roughly 10-minute breaks. Radio station hosts were piped in from other stations, reducing overall employment in the industry and leading to further homogenization. As explained by Ben Fong Torres of Britannica, companies used single programmers to run numerous stations. Many of those stations turned to syndicated shows and out-of-town disc jockeys who did ostensibly local shows through voice tracking, pre-recording their comments and commercial breaks, often customized for a variety of stations in different cities, and thereby put many other DJs out of work. Companies monopolized Top 40, rock, and other formats in many markets, eliminating competition between stations. Critics accused the biggest companies of centralizing music programming, leaving local programmers and music out of the process. Playlists tightened, which resulted in heavier repetition of popular songs. Broadcasters were said to be using their power to force musical acts to work with them on an exclusive basis or face being blacklisted from all of the company's stations. And many stations cut back on supporting community events and fundraisers. Satellite radio emerged as a competitor to terrestrial radio, owing in no small part to the variety of music satellite provided. Popular radio personalities like Howard Stern exited terrestrial radio altogether in 2004, and by the end of the decade, radio was simply never the same. Today, iHeartRadio and Odyssey own about half of the radio stations in the United States, and Cumulus owns a lot too. Most of the radio stations that you listen to are owned by three companies. These gigantic corporations are connected with record labels and other related industries. They have joint ventures, equity interests, and alliances with mass media and entertainment conglomerates, like NBC Universal, Disney, and so forth. They have the reach to essentially streamline the music and radio industries by choosing the hits and using their alliances to promote particular artists. Odyssey and NBC Universal say, this is the next big thing, and through their alliance, the next big thing receives an enormous amount of airplay. These overlapping playlists are often internally called consolidated playlists or centralized programming. Corporations have always, to some degree, chosen the stars, but now corporations had a cleaner and more direct line of attack. More than ever, they choose the stars. Olivia Rodrigo is not a viral phenomenon. She grew up under the watchful eye of Disney and then signed to two labels that are both owned by Universal. On the rarest occasions, an unknown will be astroturfed into popularity by powerful media groups that are connected in one way or another with the music industry and everyone will call their song a viral hit. Don't look to TikTok either. 
Half of those TikTok songs that blow up are just chasing existing pop trends, and the other half are astroturfed by someone with money to give the appearance of an organic hit. A few major corporations chose what was popular in the early 2000s, and they have continued to choose variations of this pop-hip-hop mix for over 20 years. The homogenization of mainstream music has removed previously popular genres from the mainstream. Bluegrass, classical music, jazz, rock, and alternative rock have been relegated to niche radio stations. Rock is still on the radio, but not in the way that one would hope iHeartRadio, Odyssey, and others tend to brand rock stations as classic rock. New rock? Not so much. No radio station play, no hits. Rock bands are harder to control than a regular on the Disney Channel, and you only have to pay Olivia Rodrigo one paycheck as opposed to three, four, or five in a rock band. Plus, bands break up all the time, and The Weeknd can't break up with himself. In fact, no bands, rock or otherwise, are all that popular anymore. I'm scrolling through the Billboard 100 right now, and outside of temporary collaborations, I don't see a single band. Travis Scott featuring Drake is not a band, and big stars having a band feature on the track does not count. As explained by Dorian Linsky of The Guardian, when Maroon 5 broke through in the 2000s, there were new bands forming all the time, many of which quickly proceeded to go platinum and headline arenas. In the realm of pure pop, Meanwhile, talent shows such as The X Factor became a reliable incubator of girl groups and boy bands, from Girls Aloud to One Direction. No longer. Popular music's center of gravity has undeniably moved towards solo artists, at least when it comes to serious commercial success. Of course, radio and streaming are dominated by pop, rap, and dance music, but festival lineups don't point to a golden age of bands either. Of those that have emerged in the past decade, only half a dozen have headlined either Coachella, Reading, Leeds, Latitude, Download, Wireless, or the main two stages of Glastonbury. It's uncomfortable knowing that one of the last big rock bands was Korn, and one could argue that it wasn't even strictly rock, but that's okay. Korn was different. For its time, it was something different. And we could all use something different right now.